We're on the skeletal system now. And we spent a lot of time last class talking about different shapes of bones. Uh, you did a good job of reintroducing the main players in bone histology. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. And you should also probably know the general shape and layout of bone. So this is not anything that's new and surprising. You've seen this in lab one. We even go back to it in lab this week. But you know what bone is. This is an example of uh, a long bone, a section through a long bone, compact bone around the outside with all the nutrient arteries and veins. You got all the osteons arranged in uh, concentric circles therein. You zoom in, yellow marrow in the adult bone, red marrow in the, the ends of the bones, or throughout in the developing bone, the yellow marrow in the adult bone, and then we have spongy bone on the inside as well. This should all be familiar. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but we will come back to this today. Fitting that Halloween is coming up. We'll come back to that today. So review that information. What we're going to look at first is how bone is formed. And this is purposefully a duplicate of some of the information that you get in lab. You get more detail in lab. The write-up in the lab manual, extremely detailed. Matt's lecture, extremely detailed. To not inundate you with detail, I'm not going to go into the same level of depth, but I will say I'd expect you to know the process in that level of detail for the final. So we're outlining it here. You have to know it for the lab final anyways. You might as well know it for the class final. Different types of bone formation or osteogenesis, the genesis of bone. The book breaks down four situations where osteogenesis occurs. Four situations. During embryogenesis or embryological development in the fetus when we don't have bone and they need to be formed for the first time. As you grow into adulthood, bones aren't the length or the thickness that they end with during adolescence, so they need to grow during that period. There is a point where the, uh, the length and thickness of bone tends to stop growing under normal circumstances and normal stress. But remodeling always continues. And I make the point to say it tends to stop growing because if you're an astronaut in space, you'll realize quickly that when you don't stress that system, you'll resorb the bone. You don't need to keep maintaining that tissue if you're not applying stress to it. But for most of us that walk around on Earth, under gravity, standing upright, bone length and thickness is fairly static. The tissue is not static. Length and thickness is fairly static. The tissue is always turning over. We're always building new tissue and resorbing or removing old tissue. That's remodeling. And another example that I don't think we're going to have time to talk about when fractures heal. When bones break, chip, crack, bone growth needs to occur to uh, seal those fractures and ensure um, rigidity and structure of the bone. So these are the situations where bone formation occurs. For remodeling, formation is one of two halves. The other half is resorption, formation and resorption. Now the names for the processes are listed here. There's two main types of bone formation. And the detail in lab pertains to endochondral ossification. And we'll talk about that second in class today. First type is intramembranous, within the membrane of, within cartilage. And really these two processes are very similar. They follow very similar procedures. The scaffolding is just slightly different and the final shape is slightly different. 
And intramembranous is the direct replacement of fibrous cartilage with bone, not hyaline cartilage like endochondral is. They both replace cartilage. So let's take a look at intramembranous bone formation. And the book does a great job of laying out this schematic for you. Four major steps. It is the simpler of the two. And this process is used for flat bones. Bones of the skull, which you learn about in lab this week. The mandible, which you learn about in lab this week. Flat bones, the scapula is a fairly flat bone as well. Shoulder blade. Four main processes. Process number one, you create what's called an ossification center. A center from which the extracellular matrix and calcified mineral salts are laid down. Where the process of bone formation occurs and radiates from or the ossification center. So specifically, remember the uh, histology slide, we have osteoprogenitor cells, we have osteoblasts, we have osteocytes. Osteoprogenitor cells are bone stem cells and they initiate this process. But you remembered that information, I think. So these cells start to lay down matrix. You can see them listed here. Osteoblasts form from osteoprogenitor cells. Start to lay down the matrix, that white area nearby, and that matrix starts to calcify. The yellowed area is now the calcified matrix that surrounds those osteocytes at this point. It's a combination of collagen, minerals, calcium and phosphate, of course, like we talked about, the major minerals in bone. And this area calcifies and generally grows outwards. Multiple ossification centers are produced and grow and join. You can think of the ossification centers as creating projections outwards. As they grow, they make projections outwards. And as these projections meet and fuse, the bridges between centers are the trabeculae, the um, almost like icicles, I think of them sometimes. They're the projections of spongy bone. This is how spongy bone is formed. These projections grow outwards, join, and are called trabeculae, creating many narrow caverns in between uh, the open spaces where blood vessels and marrow can diffuse. And so these occur in a long sheet or in whatever the template or the form is for the bone in question. In this process and in any bone formation, we aren't so concerned with how does it know? How does the shape happen? What's the program that it's following? We're going to assume the body and the progenitor cells know how to make that program and uh, the specific signals are not a major concern of ours, just that there is a program is important to remember. Here the program is flat bone. And then as the periosteum forms along the outside, periosteum, periphery, outside, osteocytes form a collar of spongy bone or form a collar of compact bone from the outer layer of spongy bone. Very thin compact bone on the outer surfaces of these flat bones. Mostly spongy on the interior. And you can see that diagrammed on the left hand side. The, uh, the top and bottom layers, the bread of the sandwich, are very thin layers of compact bone. And the majority is spongy bone on the inside. Intramembranous bone formation. So the process is similar for endochondral. And again, you'll, you'll have more detail in lab, 
but some center calcifies and grows. There is delivery of nutrients uh, or not. I'll talk about that in a second. And growth of this bone as it projects outwards and fuses, fuses together covers the template uh, that was laid down by the initial cartilage. And we can see a really good example of that when we turn our attention to endochondral bone formation. This has a few more steps, but it's purposefully not done in a lot of detail, although there is a really good write-up in the book, and again, in the lab manual. We follow some overall template. Here, cartilage makes a model on the top left-hand side. Highland cartilage makes a template for uh, the developing bone, and this is an example of a long bone, but all of the, or most of the bones in the body are formed by this process. Most of the bones that aren't flat are formed by this process. So we have a model which has the rough shape of a long bone. We recognize from last class the diaphysis, the main central portion of the bone, the epiphyses on the end, the metaphyses will form between those on each end of the long bone. They're not bone yet, they are still cartilage, but you can see the general shapes. model grows. The cartilage itself grows from stem cells. The chondroblasts grow the model, make the model bigger. This is before any ossification has occurred. But eventually as nutrients are delivered, you can see the perforating nutrient artery here in the third example. We start to deliver osteoprogenitor and osteoblast cells to that model. And at that point, we start to form the bone. We start to calcify and produce matrix. So transitionary period. We start to see this bone uh, form inside where the, the nutrient artery perforates. The ends are still hyaline cartilage. And this growth proceeds outwards. Growth and calcification proceeds outwards. But you'll notice as we jump to point number four, there's a big hollow area in the middle. We recognize that as the medullary cavity where the marrow sits. It's hollow. It's not calcified bone. And so as this template grows, bone is resorbed inside. So the main portion of bone forms in this way central ossification and growth outwards as the cavity hollows out. This is the diaphysis. The primary ossification center is responsible for the diaphysis. The secondary ossification centers occur in the extremities. Second ossif or secondary ossification centers. They form in the epiphyses as the epiphyseal arteries perforate the hyaline cartilage in those areas. Similar process. Nutrient supply, forming bone in those regions. The process occurs again from the inside out, more extracellular matrix, more calcification, until eventually the entire epiphysis is solid bone. The last steps are to create articular cartilage along the top half or the articulating surface. See that up here. And you'll note the epiphyseal plate. This is an area that remains cartilage, that continues to grow as long as the bones of the organism are growing. When bone growth stops, the epiphyseal plate seals, it solidifies, and creates the epiphyseal line. We saw that in the model of the long bone that we presented on Friday. The epiphyseal plate is the site of elongation of those long bones. We have the bone form, 
but it's smaller than it will be as an adult. As you continue to grow and mature, your bones continue to grow and mature until about 18, 21 years old, when your bones have reached the final adult length, all of that growth is due to growth at the epiphyseal plate. Growth in length, end to end, top to bottom, is interstitial growth. It's still endochondral ossification. It's called interstitial growth as the length of these bones increases. The epiphyseal plate has four main characteristics, and you see these in lab. Some of them are more clear than others, but you're going to see examples of each of these layers in lab. You can see uh, them with these uh, sherbet colored bands over on the left hand side. Four main layers resting, proliferating, hypertrophic, and then the calcified layer. And growth occurs upwards in this case. The bone grows upwards. Cells down here, the cartilage cells calcify and die and um, are produced from the top down, elongating the bone upwards. It's not immediately clear how these transfer over to the microscopic image on the right-hand side. And in fact, they're flipped. I guess the book thought it would make you work for it. These are, in fact, flipped. So we see the zone of resting cartilage on the bottom on the uh, microscopic slide on the right. Zone of sorry. No, oh, you can still see it. It's fine. Zone of proliferating car cartilage next to that superior hypertrophic cartilage. Third, notice these large hypertrophic cartilage cells. And finally, calcified cartilage, where the cells have calcified and they're now dead. They're no longer growing or proliferating. If bone growth occurs upwards on this side, the epiphysis moves up away from the diaphysis. It occurs in the opposite direction on the right, away from the calcified cartilage. These layers move away from the calcified cartilage. That's what it leaves behind. So you can imagine, as the bones are growing in length, the diaphysis probably gets longer. We continue to leave new calcified cartilage at the superior end of the diaphysis. And we move the epiphyses up with the epiphyseal plate. They don't increase in size. Just the diaphysis increases in length. So you'll see those directly in lab. And if you are confused by epiphysis, diaphysis, metaphysis, epiphyseal plate, you should review those portions of the long bone which we introduced Friday. Any questions here before we move on? Again, there is more detail in lab, so this is not meant to replace that experience. This is to outline and prepare you for it. Or for those of you that had labs yesterday, a brief reminder. How do bones grow in width or diameter Bones don't just grow in length. If we only grew in length, they'd become long and brittle and susceptible to breakages. Bone growth in diameter or thickness is called apositional growth. And we start by always forming concentric lamellae, rings of compact bone around the outside surface. And as the periosteum progresses and grows outwards, it grows around the nutrient, or, or sorry, the periosteal arteries. Excuse me. That line the surface of the long bone. And we don't push the arteries out. Instead, the periosteum folds around the periosteal arteries. And at the point 
where the two crests meet, we create a tunnel. Periosteum inside is now the endosteum. It's internal. It's not on the periphery. We enclose this artery. And continue to build from the outside in, forming concentric lamellae to close off this circle, this tunnel, and form an osteon, a new osteon. Then growth continues around the circumference of the bone, more concentric lamellae, rings on a tree moving outwards. As we run into new periosteal arteries, the process repeats itself. And in this way, with laying down concentric rings of compact bone, the long bone also grows in diameter. The complementary process to this that moves from the inside out is resorption of bone so that not the entire surface is solid, not the entire sorry. to continue to hollow out and enlarge in the medullary cavity to keep that strength to weight ratio optimal to make bones not so heavy to help um, leverage the action of muscles across the joints the osteoclasts, which are the complementary cells that resorb and break down bone, follow in suit as the bones increase in length, dissolving or resorbing bone from the inside out. Not completely. The diameter still increases, but we large in the medullary cavity as a positional growth proceeds outwards. So this is the level of outline that I want for today, but this will prepare you, if you have yet to take lab, for the increased detail you will see there, plus examples that will hopefully highlight these processes and um, bring home ideas like the epiphyseal plates. So if we, if, if we expect, if we... Um, Trust that bones grow, and in their final form, we have an adult skeleton. The next phase is to consider the organization of that skeleton and the actions that skeleton allows. So before we move on to divisions of the skeleton, you have these notes, right? They're, on, they're in the slide set on Moodle. Yeah? I heard a lot of sighs as though there, there wasn't anything to follow along with. Are there any questions before we talk about divisions of the skeleton? No? Okay. 206 bones divided into two main categories. Axial and appendicular skeleton. The axial is the focus of, I believe, this week and next week's labs. They're the axis upon which the rest of the body is built. The appendicular skeleton is composed of the appendages, the upper and lower limbs. And we had this thought um, yesterday in lab. A, a really interesting new lab would be to provide you with all the bones of a skeleton and simply have you build it at some point. Not this year. That would be an interesting, uh, an interesting lab, I think. And I was struck by the idea, looking at the skeleton in the corner, it seems like it would be easy, right? It seems like it would be too easy. It's hard to confuse a femur and a humerus, or a femur and a skull. It's hard to confuse the, uh, the ribs with the vertebrae. And indeed, as you break down all the bones in the body, they do seem to be obvious 
at least their general roles are obvious. When you start to have to differentiate individual vertebrae in the spine, it might be more difficult, or carpal bones, there's small uh, square bones in the palm of the hand that even when you know what their names are and how they're arranged, it's almost impossible to put them together. But we know there are 206. They're organized as such. They articulate in predetermined ways. They connect to um, muscles according to a predetermined plan. They allow the passage of arteries and veins and nerves, all generally following the same scheme. And so this template is fixed, for better or for worse. So for our purposes, it's fixed. This is the organization of bones in the body. It doesn't change much. Now I always like to come back to uh, the roles of the skeleton and emphasize the idea that homeostasis plays or is a major player in uh, the structure and function of these systems. Skeleton is no exception. It does help support homeostasis, not in, the, not in the sense of keeping temperature constant or blood pressure fixed or responding to changes in that sense, but it helps with physical homeostasis. In the purest sense, homeostasis is normal functioning of Right? So the skeleton helps with normal functioning of by protecting largely, providing scaffolding for, surrounding. Cranium, the skull, is a fantastic example that you'll look at in depth, and we will today. It surrounds the brain completely, except for a few small holes and one large hole. Vertebrae surround the spinal cord, we've seen that at length. Ribs surround the heart and lungs. Like we acknowledged last class, bones do help play a role with calcium homeostasis, but that's not a major focus of our talk. We're talking about structure in this section. So we're going to use this information to build a picture of, well, we already have the types of bones. We know the divisions of the skeleton. We're going to use this now to build a picture of how bones articulate and surface features of bone. And in the lab, you have an introduction to surface features. It's a surface introduction to surface features. You don't need to know all of the surfaces and the names for the lab exam, so I'm told. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I'd like you to know them for the final. The, the lecture exam will probably require you to know the difference between a sulcus and a fossa. And so we're going to spend a bit of time looking at the different surface markings of bones in the skeletal system. And these surface markings are generally fixed. They don't change. But there might be some argument as to... Ooh, I didn't mean to put that here. Hold on. As to how to interpret each of the markings. In general, there are depressions, cavities, tubes, holes, and then there are growths or projections. And there are many subdivisions within each of those two general categories. But I think it's important to understand at least some of the common major players within each of these, uh, these two categories. When you understand at least the shapes or how um, some features are named and only react to a certain muscle or in an articulation, then it helps with understanding the setup of the skeletal system and understanding the setup of how muscles interact with the skeletal system. So I think it's important to know a lot of these foundational markings. And they're listed in the text and in the slides in a long table, but I'm not going to read through these in detail right now. You should have a series of slides in your slide set that looks something like this. 
but I'll show you a lot of what we're going to talk about here. Because I really think that the I really think that the 3D nature of the skeleton is an important aspect to consider when thinking of the, uh, the surface markings. It really helps to, um, to frame them in real time and space. So you'll see this and there will be, um, be other elements in the slide set that I'm not going to look at right now as we just look at the features of the skull together. So the first one that we just saw was the fissure. A fissure. Narrow slit or passageway. Right here. Narrow slit or passageway. Not exactly a hole, not a tube. Fissure is a, a crevice or a crease that allows passage of, in this case, the optic nerve and probably some arteries and veins. A larger hole on the other hand, maybe I'll flip back and forth so you can see. Larger hole on the other hand, it's called a foramen. Multiple holes are foramina. Foramen, you can see listed here, On the occipital bone, this large passageway that allows passage of the brain stem and spinal cord from the brain down through the, uh, the vertebrae. Foramen, large opening, large passageway. Fossa, on the other hand. Fossa, shallow depression. Fossa, which one did you look at in lab? Fossa. Oh, I don't have it on here. Yes, mandibular fossa. I'm looking for it on here, though. It's not showing up. Um, mandibular fossa, you can see the name of it there, and I can't highlight it for you on the, uh, the overhead diagram, but it seems pretty straightforward. The fossa is the point here where the mandible articulates with the temporal bone. It's a shallow depression. This one is actually a bit less shallow than most, but it's slightly concave. It's not a cavity, it's not an opening. It's the area where the mandible fits into the temporal bone. This is different than a sulcus. We already know sulci, right, from the brain, a deep fissure or a groove. A fossa is a shallow depression. A sulcus is a large um, fold, invagination. Crevice, fissure. So we know what a sulcus is, or multiple sulci. What's new is the meatus, a tube like opening. tube-like opening, the external acoustic or external auditory meatus, here highlighted in purple. You can see it would connect here with the internal acoustic meatus. This is a large tube-like structure that protects the passage of the inner ear and um, structures of the inner ear. Tube-like, tunnel-like process. Alternatively, condyle, condyle, a rounded, raised prominence or articular surface, generally where two bones meet, 
where there's an articulation with two bones. And you go over the, uh, some of the movements and functions in lab already this week. We have a whole section on joints next week, so we'll talk about the types of movements at these, uh, at these articular surfaces. You have the occipital condyle shown here, these large flat surfaces, which you can perhaps see a little bit more easily in 3D. This is where the skull rests on top of the vertebral column. Large flat surfaces to help minimize friction. Think of what kind of movements you might allow to. Think of how the, the head moves in relation to the neck and the spine. Supported equally on both sides to allow um, the spinal cord to pass through the foramen magnum. So if these are slightly rounded or raised articular surfaces, the only other articular surfaces that we'll see are facets. If condyles are slightly raised, smooth articular surfaces, facets are slightly depressed, smooth articular surfaces. So many facets that you can see on this diagram of one single vertebrae, vertebrae stacked together, and we'll see that uh, I think next week, early next week, certainly in lab next week, the interlocking puzzle-like nature of the, uh, the vertebrae and how the, uh, the joints between vertebrae need to move allow for these, um, or these facets allow for movement of the vertebrae themselves. You'll often see, in some examples, a head and a neck. They are, I think, always. Yeah, I can't think of an example where they aren't, um, where they don't occur together. Head is generally a round, large bulb on the end of a bone, and the neck is a small, thin prominence that supports the head. So you can see here on a rib, the head of the rib, supported by a thin neck portion, usually containing articular surfaces, but not necessarily. So I lost this for a second. We'll continue. <laughs> features, features, raised features. Crest. Crest is a, a notable ridge, usually in a line, sometimes curved. Crest is a prominent ridge or connection of a series of elongated processes. Here you can see um, an obvious ridge on the back of the sacrum. Sometimes there are ridges along the neck of a bone, but it's an obvious, prominent, defined raised portion. I hesitate to say line. I want to say line, but there is another feature called a line coming up, so I don't want to use the word line in describing a ridge, this is more pronounced than a line. You can see for comparison's sake, a line shown here. It's like a smaller ridge, a rounded ridge. Long, narrow, <laughs> although this does say long, narrow ridge or border. So as much as I'm trying to not confuse you by using these conflicting terms, the, uh, uh, the book and the slides that I've laid out do just that. So a long, narrow ridge, lower, rounded off, or eroded ridge is what we would consider a line. You can see the line here. It's not nearly as pronounced as on the sacrum. It's not um, as vivid or as well-defined as the ridge that we just saw on the sacrum. Uh, epicondyle, we can talk about. It's usually... A I should continue with the, uh, with the list since we're going through an exhaustive list. Epicondyle closely related to a condyle. 
raised articular surface, but not part of the articular surface itself. It's not the smooth part of the surface. It's usually above or around. It's a rough portion that might be the raised element of the bone. It might support the, uh, the facet, but it's a projection related to a condyle. It's not the condyle itself, usually in close association with a condyle. And if I had the 3D working right now, I would show you a good example on the humerus. But Oh, it's not done. There are more. Isn't that fun? Spinous process. Pretty obvious. The name implies what you're looking for. Spine or spike-like process. Here, most obviously, one of the vertebrae. The spine of the vertebrae. As... Um, as you line them up and they form a line, you know where the, the name spine comes from. The spinous processes all line up. A slender, sharp projection. You'll see a really good example of um, the styloid process in, in lab this week, which is an example of a, a spinous process. Sharp, pointy, peninsula of bone. For raised portions that don't fit into any of those categories, that are bumps or enlargements or rounded rough sections, we usually call them tubercles. And in the extreme case, the largest tubercle in the, in the body, the trochanter, is only on the hip bone and you can feel it as you press down on your side trochanter of your hip is the hip bone on the outside of the femur. Trochanter is a large tubercle that is specifically applied only to the projection on the outside of the femur. So we'll see that when we look at the femur, but you can feel it now. You can, you can palpate or manipulate it as you sit there. I can feel it right now. But any raised surface on a bone is, is a tubercle otherwise. And often tubercles are associated with muscle connections. Tubercles are often associated with muscle connections. And it's not exactly clear whether the constant contraction of the muscle deforms the bone over time or raises the bone or if it allows porous surface for the tendon to insert and connect. But the raised tubercles are often where you see a tendon connect to a bone and then a muscle um, articulate a bone and a joint. So a tubercle, a raised bump on the bone is shown over here, a miniature uh, trochanter. We don't have time to run through the summary, so there's been a lot of downloading of information. We'll conclude with the summary in class on Thursday. Before moving the joints, the actions of joints, and the articulation of bone. Have a wonderful Tuesday morning.